Thank you for being here, and thank you to EuroPython for hosting this talk. Um, I'm, I'm Xavier Thompson, and I'll present to you this talk, How to Build a Python to C++ Compiler Out of Spare Parts. Um, I put the slides over there if you want to see them live. Uh, otherwise, I'll also send them to EuroPython afterwards. Uh, let's get started. Um, so I work at a small company in Lille, um, maybe 40 people, uh, most of them based in Lille, north of France, uh, some of them remotely from across the world. Uh, and it's a company that has the peculiarity of doing only uh, free software. Uh, so for instance, there's a few softwares developed at Nexody, uh, SlapOS, uh, uh, Cloud Orchestration System, Neo, a distributed database, ERP-5, an enterprise resource planning uh, software for enterprise management, and Resist, uh, a resilient uh, mesh network using IPv4 over IPv6. Uh, sorry, IPv6 over IPv4. The reason I mention these is because they're all written in Python. Uh, ERP-5 in particular is over 20 years old, and this is to say Python is part of Nexedis DNA. Uh, which is why uh, I'm going to talk to you about performance. Whenever there's a talk about performance or discussion, uh, two facts come up. Uh, Python is interpreted, and the interpreter has a global interpreter lock. At NexED, uh, performance matters to us uh, because of the softwares we write. A good example is ERP-5. So it's an enterprise resource and planning uh, software. Uh, we sell it or we sell services about it to clients. Uh, it's open source, of course. Um, and these clients have customers. And we have a client that has a million customers, which means ERP-5 is used every month to generate over a million invoices. And this is only going to scale up the company aims to grow, aims to have more customers. So there's a fundamental need to scale up and to always perform better, uh, to optimize everything. And this is central to any development about ERP-5. Um, when performance uh, is a topic in the industry, uh, you might see a few trends. Uh, some companies choose to migrate from Python or partially, Dropbox migrated some parts to Go a few years ago. Uh, some companies uh, fork C Python and make their in-house interpreter to go faster and optimize for the use case. Uh, and some companies choose not to use Python from the start. This also happens. Um, and as a wider thing, performance is a topic in the Python world. Uh, the first proof of this is your Python. Uh, there were two talks about uh, performance yesterday. Uh, there'll be one later today uh, in this room, uh, and there'll be one tomorrow as well. Um, also, there are proposals to enhance Python about performance. Uh, in this list, the third one is particularly interesting. It's about uh, potentially removing the global interpreter lock, starting with making it optional in Python. Uh, so we might end up in a world where Python no longer has a global interpreter lock. Um, there are two global strategies to making Python go faster. Uh, the first one is faster interpreters. Uh, of course, there's the Python official interpreter itself. But beyond these, there are projects uh, to fork C Python, uh, projects in, in the industry, and also open source projects to make um, replacements for, well, drop-in replacements for uh, the interpreter, so interpreters that are fully compatible uh, with Python. And on the other hand, we see optimizing compilers, and their usage is a bit different. Uh, when you uh, look at interpreters versus compilers, uh, as I said, interpreters are fully compatible with, aim to be fully compatible with Python. Uh, optimizing compilers tend to mostly focus on optimizing critical sections. So it's the thing you'll use to make your loop that, is, uh, that you iterate many times over go faster by compiling it to native machine code. 
but the rest of your program will still interoperate with Python and with the Python interpreter. Uh, if we focus on what these offer in terms of concurrency and parallelism, um, in interpreters you have the same APIs and tools available in Python, multiprocessing, this means no shared memory, um, it, has, it works, but it has its drawbacks. Threads, and then you run into the global interpreter lock. Uh, also async await, but this is single threaded, it's more for IO bound tasks. Um, and when you look at compilers, um, they often integrate with OpenMP. Uh, this is great for data-based uh, parallelism. So uh, if you do scientific computing and you need to uh, do the same calculation for every row in a matrix. Uh, you can parallelize it with this. Um, also, uh, in Cython specifically, I don't know the particulars for others, uh, you can release the global interpreter lock and have code that runs without the lock, but in that case, you can no longer use Python. You can no longer interact with the interpreter, so in the end, you're just writing C code. Um, and this is why uh, at NixID we have this project. Uh, we call it Typen. Uh, it's a Python to C++ compiler uh, with a focus on concurrency and parallelism. And uh, as opposed to uh, faster interpreters, it doesn't aim to support the whole language, every feature. Uh, the most dynamic ones well, are not supported by Typen, but it does aim to allow compiling whole programs uh, and uh, with Python semantics, with classes, uh, with automatic memory management, with everything you might want to have if you write Python code. Uh, and looking at parallelism and concurrency, um, this is built into Typen from the ground up, so the project is thought with this in mind. Uh, Uh, this is why uh, it, it, it's, uh, it's, um, it's why we do this project. Uh, another thing is that Typen uh, is a subset of Python. Uh, it means that any valid Typen program is also a valid Python program. Uh, this is a useful property. Uh, and we still have Python interoperability, so we don't need Python to have classes to do all that, but we can. And this is useful when you just need to import NumPy or something like that. Uh, so this whole adventure started in 2022. Uh, that year I wrote a scheduler uh, in C++ with the idea in mind that it would be used for a project like Typen. But at the time it was only C++. It's an, what is called an MN scheduler. So the idea is to run many concurrent tasks over N a uh, fixed number n of worker threads. Essentially in the same way that the operating system runs uh, many processes over a fixed number of computing cores, uh, but without relying on the operating system, without uh, using, having the overhead that comes with uh, the operating system switching processes, switching threads. Uh, we offer two concurrency primitives. Uh, actually, um, there's a bit more than that, but I'll focus on these two. Uh, fork and sync. And uh, the code I'm about to show you is not C++ code because I thought I wouldn't be showing you C++ code. Uh, so it's type and code uh, that will compile to C++ code that uses uh, this scheduler. Uh, that way I avoid showing you lots of uh, C++ code. At the time I wrote the scheduler, there was only C++. Let's dive straight into fork. So fork, <laughs> is a primitive that offers an opportunity for parallel execution. Uh, it's just an opportunity. It means it can still be a sequential execution. It can still be like just a normal function call, as if the fork was not there, same thing. But it offers an opportunity if there are idle worker threads in the scheduler for another worker thread to steal the continuation. That is to say, while the fork is running its function, what comes after, what, what would run when the, the child function returns, this can actually be stolen and run in parallel uh, with, uh, with the, the child call. Um, 
This is a way to do uh, parallelization that has many advantages, uh, especially uh, in terms of um, op op performance. We seek to optimize the case where uh, the fork will run sequentially because you might have many, many fork points in your program, but maybe you have only two workers or only eight, so much less. So most of the time, a fork will not result in actual parallel execution. You don't have calls to add to keep running 1,000, 10,000, a million tasks in parallel. Uh, so by having something that is optimal and efficient in the sequential case, we have parallelism with very little overhead. Um, this is powered by a data structure where uh, the worker that is, that is doing the fork can push and pop a reference to the continuation, and other workers that are idle can steal continuations from the top. Uh, this is what the, the state of the scheduler might look like. Uh, you can have workers working, pushing, popping continuations as they do forks from their own data structure, and idle workers seeking to steal continuations to start their own data structures. Um, if we look at the fork call, uh, what happens is just before the, the function is called, the, the child call, uh, the continuation, a reference to the continuation will be pushed in the data structure. And once the child returns, an attempt will be made to pop it. And this attempt can succeed and then it's a sequential execution, it continues, or it can fail. And this means the continuation was stolen uh, by uh, another worker. In that case, this worker becomes idle and seeks to still work elsewhere. Uh, it's also possible to have forks recursively, have a function that forks, that calls a function, that forks, that calls a function. So uh, it might look like this. Um, what I want to say here is that uh, the continuations that are pushed first, that are higher in the stack of continuations, uh, these are uh, the ones that are higher in the call stack. Uh, so uh, if a continuation is still stolen, if, a, if a, a pop fails, it means all the previous ones also failed. Um, here's an example of a potential such recursive uh, forked function. Uh, so it's a naive, very naive, but parallel uh, Fibonacci function. Uh, so this is exponential, and if you, if you just look at the naive Fibonacci function, it's the worst way to write a Fibonacci function. But here the idea is that um, thanks to this fork call in the middle, it will run in parallel and spread over as many calls as are available for the work. And again, this is a case where we can see that uh, there will be many more forks than there are actual workers, so the thing to optimize is the sequential case. Moving straight on to sync, you might have noticed the call in the previous slide. Um, this is the reverse primitive. Fork allows us to fork execution into parallel strands Sync is about joining them back together and waiting until ha all have finished before continuing. Um, so in the sequential case, sync is a no operation. Again, optimizing the sequential case. Um, in, the, um, in case there was a, a stolen continuation, uh, it depends on who finishes last, uh, the child call or one of the continuations. Whichever will be the one that uh, resumes, that, that, that executes the, the code that comes after the sync. And this sync primitives offers us a, an opportunity for structured concurrency. Uh, the idea of structured concurrency is that in a function that does a fork, there will be an implicit sync at scope exit when the function returns. However it returns, whichever code path, even if it's an exception. And this is very useful because uh, it makes it easier to reason about uh, the concurrency in the program because it's localized to a function. Once the function returns, there can be no concurrency leaks. Uh, another thing important uh, when writing a scheduler is, of course, concurrent I.O. Um, let's take an example. Uh, this is a simple uh, partial a fragment of a, of a web server written in Python. So for now, this is pure Python. Think of it as pure Python code. It handles one connection at a time. It's a very basic, uh, naive uh, server. If you change it in just this slight way, 
adding this fork call and compile it with Typen, suddenly it's able to handle tens of thousands of connections at a time, solving the C10K problem. Uh, how it does this beyond forking the, the calls is that when compiling with Typen, the IO operation, instead of being a blocking operation that blocks the current thread, it's asynchronous, allowing the, the worker thread to do other work uh, until the IO completes. This uses IO Ewing under the hood uh, and looking at the scheduler state, it might be something like that. A suspended task, uh, the worker that was working on it is now idle, seeking to steal another continuation. And whenever the IO completes, the task can be run again uh, where it left off. Then in 2023 came the time to write the actual compiler. Uh, and this work was mostly done by Tom Niger. Uh, at the time, he was an intern at Nexity. He did such an outstanding job that he got himself hired. Um, and before we dive into the specifics, uh, I'll take the time to have a quick note about compiler design. What a compiler does is it uh, takes the source code, passes it, and produces a, a structure, a tree-like structure called an abstract syntax tree, which represents this code. And then the compiler can be thought of as successive uh, phases of transformations over that abstract syntax tree, until the last phase, which will produce the output code. There may be other data structures, other representations, but this is a basic uh, simplified version of what a compiler does. The abstract syntax tree comes to us for free in Python, so we wrote Typen, the compiler, in, ty in Python itself, because you can just import AST and suddenly you have a parser, um, so AST offers a parse function and a dump function that lets us look at the output. So a few quick examples. Here we see that uh, arguments are a complex thing in Python uh, because there are position-only arguments, keywords-only arguments, normal arguments, defaults, etc. How the return looks like in this case. Another thing that is used is the visitor pattern. Uh, this is um, classes that will represent the, the phases uh, uh, of the compiler uh, operating over the, the, the AST. Uh, a, a visitor is just a class that defines a visit method for each type of node. Um, and you can use the node visitor class uh, provided by AST or you can roll your own. And so just a quick look of how that might be done. Um, here we walk back the class hierarchy of the node being visited to see if we find a visit something method matching uh, this, this class or a, a parent of it. Uh, otherwise, then we call it. Otherwise, we call the generic method. Um, the generic visit might just dispatch over all children or raise an exception or whatever. Uh, and you can also implement, uh, as is highlighted here, um, uh, dispatching over lists as a convenience. Moving on to type inference. Uh, I'll be relatively quick over this, uh, but it's a central part of uh, the compiler. It's the part that allows the program, uh, any Python program to be understood by a compiler. Um, so uh, I'll just show you some, some highlights, especially uh, generics. Uh, so support for generic code. Uh, so here's a generic function in Python. We don't really think of it as a generic function in Python, but it's an add function that takes untyped arguments. It just works with whatever is addable. So in Typen, you can add two integers like this. It works. Uh, the compiler understands that the output, the result is an integer. It can add two strings. Uh, you can add uh, an integer and a string, and then the compiler will tell you that it's a compilation error, a type error. And you can define this weird class where adding whatever returns a string, and the compiler will deduce that the result is a string. Another thing about generics is generic classes. Um, the classic case is the list. So uh, in Typen, we, this is one of the limitations. We don't support heterogeneous lists of, that may contain integers and strings and whatever. Uh, so we have to have a type for the contained object. But when you create an empty list, you don't know what it might contain. Until later in the code, for example, you append an integer, and then suddenly the compiler can deduce that the contained type is int. 
code generation. This is the only part where I'll show you some C++ code. Um, if you don't know any C++, don't worry. Uh, it's just to show you a bit. Uh, let's dive in. Uh, it's about uh, showing you how C++ can be used to behave like Python, to have Python semantics, to pretend to be Python in a way. Um, so imagine we have a function, a basic function in, in Python. If you just, if you know a bit, a bit of C++, this might be how you would implement it in C++. But then you have to think about the fact that in Python, a function is a first class object. It can be referenced by other variables, like any other object. So actually, uh, we compile a function to be an instance of a class that has a call operator in C++. And that's actually what a function is in Python anyway. So this makes sense. Uh, if you have an argument, we can, an untyped argument, we can implement generics in C++ using the auto keyword. Um, you can return a ref, an attribute lookup. Uh, if we have a class, it's a bit the same thing as a function. It's uh, an object of a class that has a call operator, but the call operator returns an instance of the object. Um, so there are actually two kinds of objects in the class case. There is the type of the class, and there is the type of the instance of the class. And so we have two objects in C++. Uh, one quick thing is, uh, in Python, objects are reference counted to have automatic memory management, so we do this too. Instances, we don't return a raw C++ object, we return a reference counted object. This is how we implement it. Uh, if this class had an int in field y, it would be like this. If it had a y method, it would look like this. Same thing as the f method earlier, but in the body of the class. Um, and now we have to think about, if you do an attribute lookup and it's a method, it must be a bound method. How do we do this? Uh, we have this dot helper that does it for us. Um, and that's the whole of what I'll show you in C++. Uh, but it goes on and on. Uh, we have inheritance that way, multiple inheritance and method resolution order, uh, generic classes, and on and on. Moving on to Python interoperability, uh, for those cases where you just need to import NumPy. What's going on here under the hood, so it works out of the box in Typen, uh, what's going on is that in this code, in the result of this, this compiling uh, by Typen, NumPy will be a reference, a C++ bound reference to a Python object. Uh, the X list is still a pure C++ list. The Y uh, equals NumPy square line uh, converts the X to a Python object, calls Python to handle the NumPy call, and gets a Python object in return. And the line 13 uh, uses the type annotation to tell Typen to convert the, the result back to a pure C++ list. And the print call uh, is pure C++. There's also the call, call, so this is about calling Python, but there's also the case where Python calls you back. Uh, this works also out of the hood, uh, out of the box, but in some cases, uh, you might need to add an export annotation. Uh, if you have a non-typed function, uh, you need to tell uh, Python uh, what types to pass to it. Or more precisely, Typen needs to know what to expect. If you pass it a Python object, it needs to convert it back to an int or raise a type exception. Finally, uh, going towards a standard library, uh, the idea for this is uh, to have Typen C++ bindings using C++ implementations and Python stubs that tell the Typen compiler how to uh, call this C++ code. And this is necessary because we don't want to use Python for programs to avoid the global interpreter lock. So we have uh, implemented built-ins this way, most built-ins, uh, the socket API, parts of the OS API, but it's a work in progress. It's the main work of the project. Uh, there'll be a lot of work to do. Um, the project is now uh, available on PyPy, just a first release, so look it up if you want. And thank you for listening.
Yes, Xavier. <clears throat> so thank you for those wonderful insights. And we are now entering the Q&A session. I see already the first um, person on the microphone. If you want to um, also um, ask something, you can also put your questions on Discord. But let's just start with the microphone here on the left side. Yeah, I have uh, two questions. Uh, my first question is about, uh, yeah, does it all, will it also support callbacks like decorators? Uh, decorators? Um, so, uh, callbacks or decorators? Yeah, well, decorator is a form of callback. Okay, so, uh, so yeah. um, decorators, not right now. Uh, uh, in the, we hope to do it, but it involves C++ metaprogramming or, uh, or some decorators, like specific ones for static methods or stuff like that, is also supported straight out of the box. Uh, if you mean callbacks, like passing code to Python that is actually C++ code, that is supported, uh, just not using decorators. I have a second question. Uh, that's, have you also uh, considered using Rust instead of C++? Yes. At the very beginning, I thought I would write the scheduler in Rust. Uh, I hope to do it that way. Uh, the reason I didn't is because Rust is much more opinionated as a language than C++. Uh, so it's, C++ is so flexible that it's maybe very complicated to write C++ code directly, but it's very easy to find a way to do the thing you want when you compile towards C++. It would have been much harder with Rust uh, to do that. But wouldn't it be more harder to maintain regarding security, bugs, that kind of thing, safety? Um, not that. It would have been harder to have a Rust equivalent of Python concepts. Hmm. Uh, to have a class like we do it in C++ to have... Um, so, yeah, that would have been much harder. Great. So, you. let's go to the right side. There's also a question. Yeah, I was wondering why you not used the... Uh, um, original representation in C that you could use in C++ as well of the list object like we saw it in the talk before because then you would have the possibility to have like different values also in a list and so not so many limitations that you do it to save memory or? Um, uh, no, not to save memory. We do it because the list object is reference counted in Python uh, based mainly. Well, it's a Python object so it interacts with the Python interpreter. Uh, one specific stick sticking point is the reference count. It's not thread safe. So you can only reference a list from a single, uh, from a single uh, thread safely. So there would be work to do around that uh, if needed. Another sticking point is that uh, the list works using Python. So uh, for performance reasons, it's more efficient to have a list written pure C++, where when you do append on the list, you're not looking up in a dictionary or in a slot uh, in the class of the Python representation of the type, etc. Okay. And second question, sorry. Um, we get one minute, mm -hmm. so okay. let's do it fast. Yeah. No, 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 come okay. on, question. I okay, think yeah, so um, uh, for the scheduler, I was wondering, it's all looked a bit like async I.O. without async I.O., so why did you not build up upon async? Um, like for, with the concurrency? To, so what, what's different? Uh, and. If you're an async I.O. expert, uh, I'm willing to, to, to have your insight about this, but um, async I.O. is not meant to be multi-core uh, in execution. Uh, so it's for I.O. bound task, it works great, but what we want here is for I.O. to be able to be started by one worker and continued by another uh, if another worker becomes idle when the I.O. completes. So perhaps there's time also for a coffee because we are reaching coffee break, so yeah. you can just uh, yeah. um, go on with your if discussion. If you want to talk to me break. afterwards, I'm yes. available. So again, a warm applause for you. Thank you for your talk, and you won't quit without a cookie. Thank, oh, thank you. you.